it was wholly consistent with what was presented at prolocution and at co-locution. However, if one hasn't done that, then one cannot walk out after an avocution. Any accused that reinforces their non-consent at adlocution, by definition, cannot be bound, therefore no valid judgment can be rendered nor bond perfected. And we, we mentioned this last week. A judgment means a binding. That's what the word judgment means. It means a binding. So when we say uh, that um, we have performed an allocution and we have demonstrated non-consent, no judgment can then be rendered. So that's allocution. Very, very important. Moving forward, I did say there were a number of things to cover tonight. And again, I'm sorry that we are dealing with uh, referring to things in such detail. But I hope you're seeing the, the value of these things as we go. The next one I want to talk to you is about systems of law. And the one that I want to start with is Roman Law 251. And I look forward, if you can, and when you have an opportunity, to read these these systems of law, but I want to read a couple of elements about Roman law. So Canon 2920 and then 2923. And Roman law is the world's first fictional, fraudulent, and an equal ancient written system of law uh, written in a specifically designed magic language called Latin from the 4th century onwards, but falsely claimed of older provenance. One of the things you find about Rome is that there's an entire history which claims Rome back to the 8th century. From the 8th century to the 4th century, there is no hard evidence other than the word and testimony of dubious text that Rome had any of that form of law. Only from the 4th century onwards do we see hard evidence of Rome having a, a form of law. Prior to that, it is purely on, on evidence to be fiction. And 2921, the Yahudi diaspora. And the Yahudi are the ones that worshipped Yah, as we know as Yahweh or Yahweh. But the Yahudi diaspora, who continued to worship Set as the feminine Satan, did not have a written language until their conquering of the Etruscans. This is extremely important. In the ancient world, one of the, the histories and provenance is that the Yahudi did not have a written language because they followed the ancient tradition that writing was considered an abomination before God. And this is a tradition that was honoured by many cultures, that writing and the written language was considered an abomination. And the reason it was considered an abomination wasn't that it is a very powerful way to educate, but writing permits one who writes to tell untruths. And as we have seen in the form of the Roman cult and Western law, writing has enabled the Roman cult to create an entire illusion of history that has hidden and masked their awful behaviour, the falsity of their claims, and allow them to stay in power for a thousand years. So the Yahudi did not have a written language until they conquered the Etruscans. When they conquered the Etruscans, what they did was the entire Etruscan language and grammar was consumed and stolen by the Romans. And how they stole it was they mirrored it and inverted it. So Latin is a mirror inversion of the Etruscan alphabet. That is the origin of the Latin alphabet that we use today, a mirror inversion, no earlier than the 4th century. Now, Canon 2923, Roman law introduced countless corruptions of law, all falsely claimed as ancient customs and procedures over fairness, truth, and self-evident justice versus injustice. Instead, and this is a key, key understanding of the perversity of their system. Instead, Roman law introduced the perversion that procedures 
are more important in law than the law itself. Procedures are more important in law than the law itself. And this is the first time in history that such an absurdity had ever been claimed as legitimate. What we try and do with the positive law is give function history, give provenance to the elements of the law. Why is it important? Where does it come from? How is it used? And what we're saying here is that what, what the Romans did was that they usurped much of that by claiming procedures became more important than the principles of law itself. And you see that repeated in this system over and over again. Okay, moving forward. And I'm just going to pick through these because there's a lot of content there to read. Now I'm going to read... Uh, where are we? Uh, I won't read Talmudic law. That's one to... Uh, covering actually no we no we've covered that before we'll read that another time um, we won't do Sufi law we'll go to Anglo-Saxon law okay we'll do Anglo-Saxon law so uh, actually before we do Anglo yeah we'll do Anglo-Saxon law so Anglo-Saxon law is article 256 so Anglo-Saxon law, also known as Anglais law, Catholic law, and Carolingian law, is a written system of law first introduced by Charles Martel of the Franks in the 8th century in the new language of Anglais, later known as English and Old French. The sons of Charles Martel formalised Anglo-Saxon law, also known as Catholic law, by 751, with the investiture of the first Catholic Pope, being Carloman as Zacharias I in Rome. Now, this might sound very odd for a number of people. If you want to know more background, I suggest you go and look at a site called one-evil.org. That's one-evil.org, one-evil.org, to see the true history behind the Roman cult and behind the formation of Catholicism. If you're interested about the date of 751, which is a true date, if you add the prophecy of Daniel, instead of interpreting it as three and a half years, and instead of interpreting it as 1260 days, which is what three and a half years is, and instead interpret it as 1260 years, then 1260 plus 751 will get you to 2011. Now, under Anglo-Saxon law, the Pippins formed the cornerstone of their law on the Bible, which they called the Vulgate. And the Vulgate doesn't mean vulgar, it just means common. It means common uh, and published, published to all. And that they, it extended on the Septuagint of, Septuagint of the Holy Roman Byzantine law, the Greek uh, Bible. Now, I'm going to slip through these, but it's important because I have described in the past that we misinterpret the rights of Anglo-Saxon or Catholic law as common law. And you hear this time and time again. It's a misrepresentation, deliberate misrepresentation, not by us, but by the system that states a right in common law as common law when it really is Anglo-Saxon. So I want to be clear that we are talking about Anglo-Saxon rights and not common law rights. So under Anglo-Saxon law, and we'll get whipped through this, we see that they create a new form of land. Now prior to, prior to Anglo-Saxon law, the concept of land was called a terra, which is a, a Latin variation of tara. And uh, in uh, the other concept in Rome was lares, was the other term of land. So what they created under Anglo-Saxon law was a concept of len, Lend or land. And they said that land was the absolutely owned by God, with the church the absolute landlord without dispute. And all nobles then were ultimately tenants. It was Anglo Saxon law that created it. 
2953, they also changed the concept of the roles of the nobles. And so when they did that, they changed them to make sure that the role of the nobles was something worthy of being a noble, as opposed to simply being born into it. They stripped the, they stripped the concept of noble titles, which had become franchises purchased in, in Europe by people who were prepared to pay money to Byzantine Empire, to Constantinople, to buy a title. They threw that out, and they said that there were three essential titles, uh, and that it wasn't by um, uh, money, but it was by uh, the behaviour of people. So those were Lord, from Latin Lordus, meaning praiseworthy, worthy of meritus, then Baron, from the ancient word, the Gaelic word bara, or bar, meaning rod or a measure of value, and an earl from the ancient Gaelic also, meaning brave man, warrior, and leader, chief. So lord, baron, and earl were the three key levels of nobles under Anglo-Saxon law. And under the, the ecclesiastical structure, Anglo-Saxon law was the first to introduce the concept of the priest, the bishop, and of course the vicar of Christ. Priest from uh, priost, a councillor, a village elder, bishop from uh, biskiop, uh, which also meant priest, and of course the vicar from the ancient concept of vicarius in Latin being the primate. So the lords were then placed into territorial divisions called manors, meaning to possess or abide by agreement, hence the lord of the manor. Barons were created land, which were called fee or fi, from fides, meaning trustworthy, honourable, loyal, safe, and earls were granted recognition in terms of villages, villas, meaning country homes. So this is all structure under Anglo-Saxon law, not common law, not feudal law. Now to ensure uniformity of leases and, 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 and use of land, the Anglo-Saxon law created the, for the first time the concept of the tenant and the tenancy agreement from Latin tenere, meaning to hold and keep, which literally means one who holds land by tenure. And then the concept of holding was important because it implied obligations as stewardship, not simply ownership. So similar to ancient Irish property, the Pippins honoured the concept of surety and obligation in the form of the oath. So the oath of the tenant to uphold their obligations was called their bond, Hence, my word is my bond. My word is my oath. And so tenant farmers were called bondsmen in recognition of standing of their oath, not because they were considered slaves. And then in Anglo-Saxon law, we see two key rights with tenancy, the right of equity and the right of redemption. So the right of equity being the right of fairness and fair use, where the tenant had fair right of use, and right of redemption, that the tenant had the right to make good for any wrong and therefore redeem their honour. So I hope you see in just these few canons how important Anglo-Saxon law was in establishing these fundamental rights, which we mistake, unfortunately, as being common law rights. Moving forward. So let's move forward to... Feudal law, 258, feudal law. Canon 2963. Feudal law, or fee, udal law, is an equality, inequality system of law created in the 13th century by Roman Pope Innocent III and the Venetian noble families as a franchise to attract suitable warlords a militia leader who pledged complete allegiance to the Roman cult to be granted a royal title and immunity or license by Rome to kill ancient landowners, take their place and rule the population as worse than animals in exchange for regular taxes paid to the Roman cult. The Dark Ages wasn't prior to 1000. The Dark Ages was from the 13th century until the 16th and 17th century. That was the Dark Ages because that was the age that the Roman cult instituted